Hi everybody. Did you know that a lot of people consider St. Paul to be a Gnostic? So we're going to talk all about that tonight on Talk Gnosis. Hi everybody, it's Father Tony Sylvia here and joining me is Jonathan Stewart. Hello Jonathan. Hello Father Tony. And we have a guest with us tonight to talk about St. Paul and his relationship to Gnosticism, both uh, ancient and modern, and that is Dr. Michael Kaler from the University of Toronto, and then another word that I don't know how to pronounce. Welcome, Dr. Kaler. It's Mississauga. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, Canadian, oh, who knows? <laughs> it's just, uh, it, you know, funny Canadian words, but uh, we're glad you're here nonetheless of my lack of ability to pronounce uh, town names in Canada. So thank you for joining us on the show. You're welcome. So let's get right into it. What um, a lot of people say that St. Paul was uh, was actually a Gnostic. Don't a lot of the letters attributed to Paul uh, kind of rail against Gnosticism and uh, try and warn communities against the dangers of Gnosticism? Um, yeah, that's a tough question. Uh, let me okay. I, I will say a lot of the letters attributed to to Paul uh, use vocabulary that is typical of the vocabulary that you find uh, in later quote unquote Gnostic writings, and they they discuss concepts that were important for later quote unquote Gnostic authors. Yes, mm -hmm. so for sure for that, um, it's a what I my. I'm not a believer in pre-Christian Gnosticism, so uh, and or, nor am I a believer in first century Gnosticism. So my take on that would be that Paul was, although not a Gnostic himself, was one of the thinkers who would have stimulated um, the theological reflections of later thinkers who formed what we call Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that, actually, because we've had a number of guests sure. on the show, uh, different scholars who yeah. are on various sides of this issue as to whether or not we can have a Gnosticism or not. Where do you fall in that? Is Gnosticism you useful? <laughs> Oh, is the term useful? Um, I've been taking a lot of flack from this recently. I think, uh, yes, I do think it's useful. However, I don't, um, I do agree with people like Michael Williams, uh, who sort of took took down the whole, uh, a lot of the stereotypes about Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. What I recently argued uh, at a conference hosted by Jeffrey Kripal at Rice University was that, yeah, let's keep Gnosticism because A, it's useful in a fuzzy way for talking about the ancient world, and B, it's been in use pretty continuously for the past 200 years in the modern world. So we're not gonna get away from it, let's keep it. But instead of going to heresiologists or whoever for definitions, why don't we try going to the primary sources that everybody who uses Gnosticism admits are Gnostic, uh, by which I mean the Nicomati texts. So my, I do use the word Gnosticism, but for me, Gnosticism is stuff that looks like what we have in Nagamati. Okay, so we're talking right. about Sethianism, Valentinianism, uh, and the things that are kind of yeah. in that sphere. I would go, yeah, except I would go the reverse there. I would say that um, we do have some indication from the Nagamati texts that they have this conceptualization of a different category called Sethianism from Valentinianism, which we mm -hmm. see in Codices 1, 11, and 7, uh, which move from a Valentinian focus in Codex 1 to a Sethian one in Codex 7. But we see in other Codices, like Codex 5, that they're perfectly happy having Valentinian stuff cheek by jowl with Sethian, with other kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm not... I'm not sure that that distinction, Sethian Valentinian, I'm not sure how operative it was for these people. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, it's, it's funny, Dr. Kaler, when we're, when we're talking about definitions and just the ease of, ter of use in terms. We had uh, Dr. Dylan Burns on last year, and he was saying, oh, I don't really like talking about the Sethians kind of in the Karen King mode. We can talk about the Sethian texts. But then we yeah. went ahead and all of us just said Sethian anyways even referring to the group just because right. it's just easy. Yeah, it is. Um, this, is, yeah, this is a great segue. Um, so I'm wondering, does, does Paul, St. Paul, the same Paul that we know from the canonical, canonical Bible, does he does he appear in the Nakamati texts? And how is he sort of presented in these texts? Oh, he rep he's represented in a bunch of different ways. I've sort of, <clears throat> but one, one distinction that I feel that's a, 
useful to make in terms of how he's represented is between what I call heroic Polynism versus literary Polynism. So the distinction there is there are a lot of texts that use Paul's writings. There are other texts that present Paul as a figure, as sort of a hero in the text, like the classic one being the Apocalypse of Paul, uh, but also the Prayer of the Apostle Paul, where Paul actually shows up kind of as a figure. So he's he's definitely well represented in the Nagamati writings. Um, yeah, both as a heroic figure and as he, the... the with the the letters attributed to him being used by those authors, right. So so even in some of the texts where he may not be a figure or a hero or or the main star, we can see some of I don't even know if I want to say his ideas, but we can see some of his thought and his language popping up as totally. well. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and um, just just like uh, the we're talking a little bit over this uh, over email, but there is this idea. It's kind of a a pop biblical history idea, and it's like it's in thriller novels. <laughs> But there's this, there's a very common perception when people talk about Gnosticism that Paul set up sort of a, a woman-hating, repressive church, and the Gnostics were a group opposed to that. But that that's that's really not a dichotomy that exists. Like, would you say that the the ancient Gnostics, you know, really many of them seem to revere Paul and drew inspiration from him? Yeah, I mean, I've. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I thought that that whole di the the spread that presentation of Paul that you give is is funny because for literally millennia, Paul was regarded as as Tertullian called him the apostle, the Gnostics apostle, or the heretics apostle. Mm -hmm. The heretics uh, apostle. He was. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people did consider him that. I mean, the the you know Gnostics and and other heterodox Christians like Marcionites and people like that used him a heck of a lot. Um, and there used to be theories that he was underused by mainstream Christians just for, uh, in the early church for that reason. Uh -huh. So it's interesting to see that reverse. Now, I don't, I don't know to answer your point sort of in order. In terms of woman hating, um, there are some. There's there's been, clearly been some redaction in Pauline letters to put in some misogyny in there at some point along the line. Uh -huh. We know that Paul's. You know, church in Rome, like he's writing to a woman who's the head of the church in Rome. There's, uh, he's. I don't know if there's any early Christian or any movement from that period in time which is not to some degree misogynist, and that includes yes. Gnostics, definitely. Yeah. So I don't know if Paul is any worse than uh, some Gnostic author talking about how the 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 fires of lust, you know, corrupt you into hanging out with women or something like that. Like, I don't know that anybody back then is not misogynistic. Mm. Um, point one. Uh, point two, I don't, the, the relationship with Paul, again, I, I would not say that there is any such thing as when Gnosticism, as Gnosticism, sorry, when Paul is yes. writing. I don't think of that course, exists. Of course, of course. Yeah. So the later, the later groups. Yeah, I don't, yeah, but even the early, like, I don't know, I don't know what exactly you mean by Gnosticism, but there's certainly oh. absolutely zero evidence outside of Paul's letters for anything relating to Gnosticism in the first century, you know, period. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think he could have been forming a church to oppose a movement that didn't exist at the time he was writing. Of course, of course. Yeah, and that that's just it. I, I bring up this idea because it's a common one, really, that you can kind of find in thriller novels like Da Vinci Code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, your view about first century Gnosticism would be, uh, or sorry, pre, like, uh, 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 yeah, first century Gnosticism and Gnosticism predating Christianity, that's basically the mainstream scholarly view, right? Is that this is a, a second century movement. Yeah, I think uh, there was a guy called Ed, Edwin uh, Yamauchi who did a really good book sort of demolishing the pre-Christian Gnosticism idea. This is like 30, 40 years ago, but we have no texts. Um, basically, the people who argue for a pre-Christian Gnosticism, um, they're, they're not relying on any sort of primary sources or even really secondary sources. What they're relying on doing is taking apart uh, very, very hypothetically taking apart existing Gnostic texts and saying, oh, here's this core in the middle that I discovered that doesn't seem to mention Jesus, therefore it's non-Christian, therefore it's pre-Christian, you know, that, like, it's just, it's not, I think most scholars would not agree uh, with that procedure. Right, right. But, uh, 
just kind of going back to my earlier or the earlier question, earlier point, I think the show will definitely blow some people's minds if they're outside of the scholarly world and first coming to it, just because of this this kind of weird pop cultural idea that the second century Gnostics must have been opposed to Paul, or there was a such thing as a first century Gnostics that that Paul was was opposed to, but that that would be more or less incorrect, right? My feeling is, yeah, I don't think. For, I think there's no evidence of a first century Gnosticism that Paul was opposed to. Uh, and in the second century, no, there's no, the, the Gnostics, I mean, Valentinus, who's your classic Gnostic teacher, was claimed to have been a pupil of Theudas, who was a pupil of Paul. I mean, there's there was clearly, or probably an attempt on the Valentinian part to actually establish a lineage involving Paul. You know, so I think there's no, I think Paul was contested territory at that time, I think everybody was grabbing for him and wanting to show that he supported their their view of things. Mm -hmm. Right. You can kind of see that, although you may not think that, that Acts is second century, but you kind of see that in Acts, right? That that's sort of a, uh, a proto-Orthodox attempt to grab on to, to Paul and be like, he's our guy. Absolutely. Yeah. And what do you think about the uh, the authorship of the pastoral epistles? Do you think that the the same person is writing the pastoral epistles as uh, writing the rest of Paul? I guess there's two there's there's two angles to that question. Like in terms of the person sitting and you know dipping their their pen in the ink and writing the the epistles. No, I totally don't. I don't think it was the same person. Um, but on the other hand. I don't know that that authorship was doubted in early Christianity, mm -hmm. right? So that makes a difference to me. Like, de definitely, if we're concerned with the actual authorship of these actual texts, I don't, I don't believe, and I think I'm with the vast majority of scholars here, mm -hmm. I don't think that Paul wrote them. But if we're concerned with the reception of these texts by Christians in antiquity, that's a different matter. Yeah. And I, I doubt that many of them would have read whatever first or second Timothy and thought this isn't Paul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. How are we uh, how are we doing for a time, Father Tony? I'm wondering We've got we a can... couple of minutes if we can get a quick one in. Okay, we'll 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 get a quick one in. Uh uh, Dr. Kaler, uh, the, Paul does write about the, uh, the the ruler of this world uh, yeah. in in some of his uh, some of his letters. Uh, yeah. What what did he mean by that term? And then how did the later second century Gnostics interpret that? You know, I I'm not totally sure what Paul meant. I I, I would imagine. I think what what happened with the second century Gnostics is they sort of scaled. They scaled the bad guy or the good guy up a level, sort of further away from the world. So I suspect that yeah. when Paul talked about the ruler of this world, he would have an idea of like literally this world or maybe the lower three spheres. I don't depending on his cosmology, but you know, a sort of a lower area which was run by rebellious angels or you know nefarious angels or some sort of lower hostile divine figures. Um, and then I think he would have viewed that there was a God, uh, much the Old Testament D type God, uh, really running the show over top of everything. Right. And then I think what what the Gnostics would have done later was just scale, just shoved that Old Testament good God figure, or just shoved the goodness up to a figure that was even higher than the Old Testament God, and interpreted the Old Testament God as one of the the angels, uh, you know, one of the the head of the bad guys ruling this world. Mm. Yeah. A la, uh, you know, Platonism and uh, and and its sliding scale of <laughs> of divinity, yep. yeah. Yep. Bingo. Yep. So uh, let's um, let's get into more of that particular issue as we get into the podcast. But uh, okay. in the meantime, why don't you tell people where they can find you on the internet if they want to look up your stuff? Uh, yeah, I guess you you said that you were going to be posting my academia .u address. Mm -hmm. or yeah, yeah. We'll that's, put that that's, in the description. That's the that's the best place to go, I think. All right. Is, isn't that a great website? I found so, I find so many interesting <laughs> things and people on there. Okay. There's a lot of nifty stuff up there for sure. Yeah. All right, then. So let's wrap up the video portion and then talk about okay. uh, more of this uh, interesting person and his connection to Gnosticism in the podcast. And remember that if you are a patron on our Patreon page, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Gnostic, 
you can uh, watch all of these videos uh, a couple of weeks early and you can see the podcast as a video version and uh, I just got in a bunch of stickers so you can see one of them might see right there in the middle and uh, so you'll be able to uh, get a nice sticker so uh, you know just another just another great service we provide here at the Gnostic Wisdom Network so uh, that'll be it for tonight and I thank you once again Dr. Kaler for joining us uh, pleasure Thanks to talk to you and we will see everybody who is watching along at home next time This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.